Hey, and welcome to Hyperdox Live, our Saturday show. We are so excited to be here with you. It's been a few weeks, and today we have an extra special guest with us. Um, I am really excited to introduce you to Darren Hudgens. Um, Darren is um, an educator, uh, a longtime educator, a presenter, a keynote speaker, an author. I mean, I could keep going on and on a CEO, uh, um, a big, huge thinker. And I first um, uh, have to say, I'm going to tell you a story about you before I let oh, you know that um, I was introduced to Darren by my dear friend, Rushton Hurley, in 2010 at the Merit Program. And he came to speak to us. And I had never heard another educator like this, speak like this. And I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, who is this person? I need to know more. And I quickly learned that Aaron is, and um, I, I think this is your word, he's a curator of good thinking people. And so he has like, kind of the Pied Piper of this, like um, surrounding himself with um, big thinkers who love to get together and ponder big ideas. And I continue to work with Darren up in Portland at his integrated conferences through the OETC and met and connected with so many other amazing educators um, from all over the country. And I just really value our friendship and our conversations. And I'm beyond excited to bring you mm -hmm. into the community today to talk to you. Thank you, Darren, for joining us. So. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, curator is certainly a piece in there. I like to also put in um, purveyor of instructional strategies, like trying to share the wealth, like what we learn with all these great people and then push it out because, you know, we're all, to me, it's about the best instruction, the best experience we can give to our kids because they, you know, it's, it's sure. a cliche, sure. but they sure. are our future. Share. Darren, thank you so much for being here. I know the three of us are really excited to just, have you share all of the thinking that you do. And I think I think our audience will too, because as a HyperDoc creator, we're always thinking about how to create purposeful lessons. And you know, you're I know you're gonna have a lot of ideas for us, especially with today, today's world and around media lit literacy. Mm -hmm. I think every teacher who's teaching any grade level and any subject needs to really be thoughtful and mindful around media literacy. Um, so I just want, want to thank you for being here and ask you to just share with us um, the first thing that comes to your mind. I know you wanted to share a story with us around the culture code and mm -hmm. that can kind of help frame our discussion for today. Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> I get a lot of inspiration from a lot of different people, a lot of different resources, as we kind of talked about. And most recently, um, I, I I don't know if other people share this thing, but I'm on this computer a lot now uh, because of obviously the pandemic and Zoom and all those kinds of things. And so I have found myself actually not wanting to sit down and read a book because I'm reading all day on a screen. And so, um, but I also need to move and I need to do things and all that. So I've gone out. Uh, recently and I had to rebuild a deck. Um, and while I did that, I had kind of a queue of audio books. And one of the books that I picked up, which is a, I can't remember if it's from 2014 or 2016, but it's it's called The Culture Code. It's by Daniel Coyle. Um, and I'm always fascinated by the, the pieces of culture and how you build them. Um, you know, schools are small cultures within themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it starts out with a, with a story called The Good Apple. And I was curious, like, well, what is this about? And so he sets it up with a with a character named Nick, and Nick is a uh, a player that is set to sabotage uh, forty different groups, and these are groups that were um, small groups that were built to try to like a startup culture, like how do you build a culture from scratch and build a brand and all those things. Anyway, um, uh. Um, excuse me, I can't remember, a psychologist, I can't remember what actually field he's in, but his name's uh, Will Phelps. He's from the South Wales in Australia. He wanted to to basically bring this Nick character into these groups as almost um, a, a secret player in them, or they, I think they called it a Petri dish, like adding something to the Petri dish. And so he played three archetypes. One was the jerk, 
Um, one was a slacker and one was the downer person. Mm -hmm. And immediately I'm thinking of like staff meetings I was in and the particular characters, you know, like we re literally would have teachers who during a staff meeting would pull out a newspaper and start reading the newspaper right. during, you know, which uh -huh. clearly communicates all these things. And so I'm, you know, right in my brain, I'm like, oh my gosh, these are the role this fits so much. Well, they ended up calling this or they called it the bad apple experiment. And so they were adding the bad apple. Well, what they found is in all these groups, he, this character was just one person was able to essentially poison the group 30 to 40%, which means 30 or 40% of the group went along with whatever character he was playing and it actually made them perform less. They weren't able to, to do as well. Um, with the exception of one group and they called them the outlier group. And nobody noticed this group because um, they videoed all this right out of the shoot. And it was actually Nick, the person who was doing the, you know, the, the, those roles who said, well, there's this one group that, 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 that was different. So they went back and they studied this group and they watched what happened. And there was actually one character in the group who would deflect, uh, pivot or like, like change everything that he did. So, so even though he would do something, he would then turn around and kind of uh, take the focus off of him. And he didn't yell at him. He didn't scream at him. He didn't say, I'm the leader. You shut up, go over there. You know, like any of those kinds of things. He would just very subtly change things, which they found made the environment um, comfortable, uh, engaging, helpful, um, and it was all through body language, through humor, through all of these types of things. And so what, what, they, what they're able to do is find out at the end of the study is, is it, was, it was a bit of confusing to them because what they expected was, is most of the time we measure group performance based on these measurables like intelligence or um, skills or ex experience, like those are the good groups. If we just put those all together, um, and not to switch gears on another thing, but if you've studied anything about like the uh, marshmallow experiment or anything like that, you find out like little kids did better because they don't have all those other things. Right. But, I love that experiment. Yeah. So anyway, what they what they ended up finding is that subtle patterns of small behaviors mm -hmm. actually have more of an impact about the success. Um, and then the, the second part was we typically think that you need a strong leader to come in and give you that motivation, give you that vision, share this whole thing. But what we're really connected to is, is, is solidarity. Like if we feel like we're in a group that believes in us, cares about us, um, shares same common values, we will actually perform better even if there are outside forces that are kind of attacking you. Um, and it's not about being smarter, it's about actually safety. Um, and so the reason that I wanted to bring it up is we're going through this period of time right now um, prior to the pandemic, which was, you know, uh, well, let me back up a second. You brought up media literacy, mm -hmm. uh, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, malinformation, uh, all of this stuff has been around since the beginning of time, since humans have come together in groups. What's different has our ability to amplify mm -hmm. all of these kinds of things. Um, and, and we can get into that, and I'm sure we will as, as we go on. But I find it interesting that, um, you know, this, this Maslow versus Bloom or Maslow before Bloom has kind of reemerged, even though most educators, when they went to, to you know, become a pre-service teacher or whatever, you learned about these things, right? You learned about Maslow. You remember, and now in the sense of being attacked, um, again, by ourselves, um, our uh, different forces and, you know, say the pandemic and all these things. Now we're retreating to what this very bad apple kind of situation came up is we're, we're retreating to safety. Um, and unless we find a, our way again in, in safety, whether that's in school buildings, whether that's in communities, whether that's in uh, um, divisive politics, tribalism, um, races, uh, you know, you go down the line until we find some safety. And, and, and 
don't confuse this with passive, like we don't need to talk about it or, you know, passive aggressive or, or pretending it doesn't exist. That's not what it was. It's finding these other ways that we can connect and come together. Um, that's the only way we're going to get our amygdalas, mm -hmm. which are um, the fight or flight piece of the brain to calm down. Mm -hmm. And we have never had a moment in our history where we've ever been this stimulated in that part of the brain. Uh, and I'm not saying that, that World War II or I'm not saying like other parts of history haven't had it. It's just with the bombardment of information, with a crisis of authenticity, with wanting the speed and accuracy of our information and then just our own biases, we've never had it stimulated like this before. And I know I threw a lot out there, but it's um, safety. Uh, let, let me put it down to safety, safety, safety. Yeah, no, thank you for starting us off with that as the, as the foundation of what I think every classroom teacher is trying to do as well. Mm -hmm. you know, that is what you learn first. There needs to be safety and it needs to be emotional and intellectual safety to take risks and explore and be curious, but also to try new ideas. And I love how you've talked about a lot of things, um, a lot. I could go <laughs> I get excited. Sorry. I know, it's wonderful. But when I'm thinking about that information overload too, it's mm -hmm. not just access and content. Um, and the content can be triggers for so many different things. Mm -hmm. But, and then when you were describing the um, class, the culture within that, that culture is in a classroom, but it's also on social media and it's also mm -hmm. on the news. And so um, as I think about all the different topics, you even went to our amygdala and our brain mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. that's like, how do we get there? Because our topic and our title for today's show is media and its impact on social and emotional or mm -hmm. well in our learning. And so um, I, I want to start with taking a little step back with you. Please. Because we have been home, you know, shelter in place mm -hmm. in March. Mm -hmm. All had to grow as learners and as families in our own culture, in our communities, um, in the home, in the school, in the city, in the town and beyond. Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you seen that have an impact on um, your, what are some things that you've done yourself? You mentioned listening to books instead mm -hmm. of reading them. Um, mm -hmm. any other quarantine sessions or things that can kind of help bring light to strategies for that? Well, I mean, if anything, the pandemic has slowed us all down and forced us to reassess not only who we are, what kind of culture we want to live in, and where we're going to go next because of this uncertainty. Like we don't know. Uh, people can profess they know what's going to happen. And you can study the tea leaves of 1918 and all those kinds of things, but we don't know. Um, and um, especially when you're fed a bunch of information that has all these different ideas of what's going to happen. Um, we as social servants have gigantic hearts. And we want to save and help everyone. And the, the reality is um, you got to work on yourself first, because mm -hmm. if you're a mess, you're not going to help those. Um, you're, you're not going to teach those kids. You're not going to be able to work with those parents that are frustrated because their situations. So for me, it's always been about exercise. Um, when I don't exercise, I struggle. Um, and we know physiologically exercise, you know, changes your hormones, again, your, your brain physiology, all those things. So for me, I have to do that. Uh, number two, doom scrolling and sitting around reading social media, um, going through all that stuff. It's not saying that there's no good there, but if all you're doing is trying to get continual second by second updates of the next, uh, you know, COVID numbers or all the bad that you are perceived that's going on. Um, if you continue to go down those spirals, you're going to have um, what I used to call um, negative fantasy. Um, I used to have a, a thing upside my door when I had kids come in. If you think this class is going to suck, it's going to suck. Mm -hmm. if, if you think I'm not a math person, which I, I thought that my entire life, you're not going to be a math person. I mean, and so if we read these things and we continue to tell ourselves over and over, you believe those patterns in your head 
well, that's what you're going to find. Um, so I would, I would say that, um, there we're polarizing ourselves more than ever in for, you know, like tribal reasons, political reasons, uh, religious reasons, racial reasons. Um, you have to push yourself to listen to the other side, uh, whatever you believe that to be. Um, and not again to make yourself feel bad, but to try to understand that, you know, the empathy we talk about. Um, and then the last part I'll say, and I know those were a lot, but we've got to listen more. We, we've stopped listening to each other. Um, and that's a link to that humanity. Um, that's what that story I just told you. They didn't see any of what was going on when they went back and they listened to the, the guy that was doing it and they watched the tape. That's where they were able to pick out the little golden nuggets. So. Right, right. I mean, I'm just thinking of all the classrooms I've been visiting and all the Zoom calls I've been visiting. And mm -hmm. um, one thing that is different in this world that we are in right now is um, for, for one thing, we can chit chat on a Saturday morning together. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, which would have required us traveling to each other and we can yeah. chit with the people watching right now. And we get to choose that place that space that online and offline that creates that positive energy for being productive like the gentleman in your story who can keep nudging and keeping that energy going and I want to just dive in more to what that looks like in a classroom right now because mm -hmm. our teachers have and I want to just like give a shout out to not only elementary middle and high school teachers but um you know the social emotional piece for secondary mm -hmm. I've just noticed mm -hmm is a little bit at a different level than elementary. And I think what when you were talking about the scrolling, mm -hmm. kids do that to connect, you know, it's TikTok or whatever they're doing. Then they get on Zoom and um, they're just taking in information and kind of interacting. And teachers are doing backflips to create collaboration and to create community in an online classroom. Um, and how do we how do we bring that together so that uh, it's productive? You create that mini culture that you describe mm -hmm. your story in that Zoom room. Any yeah. any ideas for that? Well, so I have a presentation I've been doing for a while because I think people are ignoring. I mean, there's a lot of subjects they're ignoring uh, that I think are actually more critical than a lot of the curriculum that we do. One is 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 obviously media literacy. Um, because I think it has a huge impact on how kids think about themselves, how they interact with each other, their, their culture. Um, since No Child Left Behind, I have been screaming about the reduction of social studies because I think social studies uh, is a link to all those other subjects. Um, there's so many pieces to that, the psychology, the sociology, the shared history, um, the uh, uh, struggles, you know, all the themes within that. And then the social emotional part um, we, we, again, my opinion, we've gone too far. We, we went to test obsession and we forgot about the social emotional side of things and how that impacts it. If you look at statistics, the rise of, um, you know, women and how they see themselves, if you see the uh, suicide, if you like, we just go down the line, um, all of these pieces are being, you know, kind of ignored in the sake of kids must learn and pass tests. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when it comes to, uh, the, the presentation I brought up, I actually called, I kind of flipped it, but you know, you've heard the phrases, the squeeze worth the juice, mm -hmm. or, or I kind of flipped it as the juice worth the squeeze. We have to try to embed social, emotional learning, uh, media literacy. I would argue, uh, finances, like, like personal finances, things like that, like stuff that are going to impact kids the rest of their lives. We have to start embedding it into this curriculum and it's not an extra thing. It's part of the thing. So um, an example of that would be if you're going to have that Zoom class embedding in your day, even if it's 10 minutes every day um, or or a 20 minute segment or whatever, some sort of a strategy, a piece of media or whatever, and get kids to interact with it, talk about it. Um, you get to to play that teacher role where you can say, well, what do you think of this? And how about that? And have you ever thought of this? Not giving your set opinion of what it is, but like just getting kids to process. Why would somebody send this to people? Um, right. You know, that kinds of stuff. 
I mean, such a great question and um, of just asking why, like, what do you think the motivation is? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm guessing too, you would also work with those teachers and talk about like what organization is publishing this? Yes. What do you think the motivation is? And I think I think that all is connected to that listening rather than telling, right? Yep. I think yep. we're tempted as adults yep. to um, tell. And yep. as a parent and a teacher, I have an eighth grader at home, and I can tell you that um, he he knows more than I knew at in eighth grade because of the access to yep. many yep. different topics and. Our kids are more engaged now. Like with, with the election that just happened, our students were able to really see all mm -hmm. of the media surrounding that. Where you know, when I was a kid, it was just on television and on the news. Yeah. I didn't necessarily sit down and watch it with my family because I wasn't interested. But it's in their streams for you know TikTok or whatever they're on, and and so this is like more important than anything else, really, because. Yeah that SEL and awareness of the media literacy, then it's going to affect have longer term effects. And we're not saying no to it. What I'm hearing you say is how to do it, to lean into it. Mm -hmm. to discuss yeah. You, 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 I don't think you can be neutral as a teacher. I really don't. And parents aren't going to love that, but it's mm -hmm. how you go about it. If you tell them this is what you must think, right. then, then yeah, you're going to, you're going to get some fires. But if you're saying, no, we want you to be a thinker, um, that's different. Yes. And so putting in, you know, like I think somebody just posted, uh, Sarah or Lisa just posted, you know, like, like, I think I wonder kind of stuff. Like, mm -hmm. like when you show them something, don't, don't tell them right away. Um, right. I didn't. So one of the reasons it took me so long to become a teacher was because um, I thought they knew everything. I had these like idle teachers that I wanted to be and I talked myself out of it because I was like, I don't know enough. And I, anyway, I ended up coming you know, back around. I also had an interesting conversation with another educator whose family is full of educators except one. And one of his brothers came to him and he said, he said, you know, teachers are so used to telling everybody what things are like that they, you know, like this is, this is what Shakespeare thought, or this is what government's like or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they tell, 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 tell. And then, but, but they never, you know, it's again, back to that listening or more opening up people's curiosity for, again, who's triggering them? What is the access? And they put that, you know, that slide up, like there's, we've got to start asking those questions. What are the motives? Um, what are the motives of TikTok? For example, right. like I talked about it all the time. Right. Um, if you've watched, uh, and this is a biased thing, but I found it fascinating. If you've watched The Social Dilemma, which has been out, mm -hmm. um, and I would highly encourage people to watch it, they do a great job of showing you how algorithms, bots, um, uh, people uh, on down the line are understand how the brain works and have been manipulating machines to make it work. And, right. and, and I watch it. I mean, like I've got a, a senior and an eighth grader and I watch it all the time. They act like nothing ever existed in the world until you saw it on TikTok. Like, right. like, like recipes and stuff like that. Like, well, I found it on TikTok. You know, and I was just like, you know, I mean, it's like. It's Which I kind of love. <laughs> I, no, I love it too. But what they don't understand is there's an algorithm feeding them those things based right. on what they watch. There, mm -hmm. there's an algorithm recording the time that they spend on it. Yes. And I can write a book about it. Mm -hmm. You can have a show about it. But if teachers aren't regularly saying to someone, this was the perspective of that time and it's changed. And mm -hmm. there was a there was a reason for that. Now you're getting all this information. What do you do with it? And whose agenda and what are they trying to do? And um we have to talk about it more. Yeah. And we have to teach them how to self-regulate it. Not yes. To yeah. Like emotionally, how to yeah. self-regulate it, their own time, their own yeah. um, feelings, how they feel after yep. doing their scrolling, and then also how to process the content. So I, I want to put that image back up yeah, there. Please put that up because I was going to say, yeah, that, that's perfect. More about that. um, what does this mean to you and how does this fit with this media literacy? So um, 
we haven't talked about it yet, but I, I have a co-author, um, Jennifer Lagarde. We wrote a book uh, about fact versus fiction, some things we saw that was going on back in 2016. We're concerned about the future. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it again, but it, it was the, the fastest selling book in ISTE history. We didn't know that was going to happen. Um, all kinds of things have come out of it. But um, what we did find out is that that it gave people a little bit of the why and it gave them some ways how to do it, but they're clamoring for um, how do I take something and do it in the classroom? And so we're building these um, lesson plans for lack of a better term mm -hmm. around pieces of media set for um, elementary, middle and high school. And they can be used in different areas, but based on the content, it might be appropriate, you know, depending on, and you, the teacher will decide that. What we came out of it, and a lot of not a lot of people have seen this, but this is actually straight from a slide from the book, is that we've kind of figured out um, there are you know four areas or four categories, or, or as we call them, lenses, because we're taking more of a digital detective approach. Mm -hmm. Is that these are these are ways for you to suss out fact from fiction or misinformation and disinformation. The first one you kind of alluded to. Um, well, actually, let me talk about the, the first two because there's a graphic here. The top two triggers and access. There's a reason why there's a finger pointing at you because you're the one that, that controls both the trigger and the access. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom two, the reason there's a bunch of people there is because that's the community, right? So that's the outside force that is sending you information or controls that kind of information. And so we always start with trigger triggers, which is that self-regulation. We always start with that mm -hmm. because you are the only one in charge of what triggers you. Um, they're advanced in how to trigger you. And that's something that you need to teach kids. Like they know what to write in the subject line of an email or in a tag on a, on a tweet or all these things. They, they know so much about the brain and neurology now that they're embedding those things in you because they know you'll react. Um, if, if I said, uh, Kelly, I don't know your son's name, but if I found out what's your son's name, because I have all this data, I could send you a message and say, you know, have you heard what such and such did and use the, his name. And then yeah. you're naturally going to go, wait, I, I, I know I have some experience with Darren. He's now talking about my son. Oh my God, I have to open it. And uh -huh. they know those kinds of things. And so they're manipulating that um, and it's triggering that. But the, 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 the piece is, is do you have to respond right away? Mm -hmm. And the answer is absolutely not. They want you to because they want to keep you engaged because they want money from you. But mm -hmm. those triggers, we're finding that is now, um, it's becoming a regular pattern in our brain and so now when you get out on social media and they're not selling you things, if I say to you, Kelly, you don't believe in what I believe, right? I trigger you. And then now you respond, you suck, you terrible, whatever. Then you mix in bots and algorithms that are continuing to design that. Okay. So we could go on for days, but, but the trigger is the most important. If you're not triggered, um, if kids can, can think about the process of how my brain's triggered, um, uh, that is probably the most important thing you can do out of all three of these. Um, the, the last part I'll say is our brain has kind of two systems. Um, and um, I do, this is my easiest way of doing it. I do this in a lot of presentations because it's, it's the easiest way for me to do it. Um, Kelly, if you'll put your finger, if you'll, if you'll um, fold your hands together, will you do that? Okay. Now I want you to look at it and I want you to look at your thumbs. Okay. Um, you'll notice that they're either one over the top of the other, or you could even be side by side like this. So okay. what, what, what are you? I'm side by side. You're side by side. Okay. I will, I will tell you that's actually special. That's rare. So I'm just going to, we already knew you were special, but that's rare. Now, what I want you to do is change that. I want you to fold your hands again, but put one over the other. What does that feel like? A little different. Feels a little different. Feels weird. Now flip it for you. You can flip it again. Do the other thumb. Now, how does that feel? A little, even more different. Right. So um, that's the quickest way to me to show your brain and what your brain does 98% of the time 
is that quick response, that trigger, right? Because we can't be processing every little thing that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we create these little quick systems, right? Yeah. That go and they make decisions. They know that about us and that's how they're triggering us to get, again, it's about money and all those or, or hate or whatever those things are. Um, we need to get kids to the other side, which is the rational part of the brain which is the slow mover, the one that really thinks about it. Um, so you've got to get kids to be able to press pause. You've got to get them to think about why is this happening? What's going on? Who's sending it to me? All that stuff, because we're hardwired not to do that. Right. Um, and let me add one more layer. Most of our kids have no frontal lobe and their executive oh. functioning is terrible. Thank and who, yes. who's going to teach them that? That's got to be us. Yeah, yeah, it is. And we can't do that, going back to what you said earlier, unless we're doing that for ourselves. Yep. So, Amen. Amen. Absolutely. If you're if you're having a lesson, it doesn't mean you can't be vulnerable to your kids. Mm -hmm. But if you're having a lesson every day and you're screaming at them or you're crying or you're comparably upset, and, and we need to do that sometimes. That's important for vulnerability reasons and trust and building that culture like we talked about. But if you're doing that every day, Mm -hmm. You're going to send your kids on a roller coaster because they're constantly, you know, they care about you too. They don't know. They're trying to find security. They're trying to feel, figure out how to deal with this. Right. So, right. Um, so got to do you first. So fascinating. So that, that graphic that you shared um, is really helpful because it brings us to the top part triggers. Yeah. An access. And I feel like if I'm a classroom teacher, I'm going to start thinking about, media and social emotional learning mm -hmm. and explicitly teaching my students yes. to recognize triggers and access and starting with myself would, yeah. would you say that's how i could start that's, that's totally how i am going to say one thing that's going to make a lot of people mad okay. um but uh i got to talk about access because okay. we are doing our kids the the i think the biggest disservice we possibly can um by banning uh, phones in schools. Mm -hmm. And I know people are gonna go ape on me and they're gonna get all mad and like classroom management, uh, these kids are on these devices enough. I mean, they're gonna go on, but the reality is they are on them and they're right. on them all the time. And mm -hmm. you can look at statistics and even when you get into socioeconomic backgrounds, they find ways to get either a phone or get access to a phone. Mm -hmm. Not just because everybody's doing it, but because everybody's doing it. Right, like it's there, and they have access, and all that. Stuff. I interrupt you really fast. Where's your phone right now? My phone is off to the side. It's it's over. I can pull it here, I, but I don't even have it on. I want to ask the yeah. audience though, like, who's got their phone? Who's got yeah. their laptop? Yeah. Right? Oh, Thanks, Sarah, Sarah popped in. There we go. I mean, I mean, I'm in meetings all day, texting, listening, <laughs> texting, talking. Right? Just, yep. just, it's a different world. And this, for most teachers, the what this device does, I mean, like the computers we grew up with, that's now in your pocket, like times a uh, yeah. hundred or whatever. And so the, the ability of things you can do with those is, is like nothing ever in history. Now, there's always the negatives to it, but we need to start understanding, we've got to teach kids about access because um, when you look at a phone, what what can be shown on this small screen is very different than probably what I think you guys are all looking at, which is a browser in your in your in your device. Mm -hmm. I have can see more because it's a bigger real estate. What kids can't see is a simplified design in Snapchat. They can't see um, a lot of things in a simplified design in TikTok. And right. what I mean by that is who's the author? Uh, when was it shared? Uh, was this picture ever shared before? Mm -hmm. Has it been doctored? Is it a credible source? Like all these things that we need kids to ask questions about. No, they say, Kelly sent it to me. Right. I trust Kelly. Uh -huh. Kelly must have vetted it. It mm -hmm. must be okay. I'm going to share it. Yeah. And once I share it and she didn't vet it, you've just spread misinformation, disinformation, bullying, all those kinds of things. Um, and if we don't talk about it and we don't get kids to understand that, you know, that these uh, have an impact, like if you're constantly checking your notifications, 
they got you. I mean, that's, again, that's a trigger thing. But if we ban them all the time and we don't use them and we don't do any of that, then they they become that forbidden fruit and they're doing it on their own and secret and they don't really understand it. And all the adults don't get it. They don't know me. Um, I teach this stuff and I have constant battles with my own children right. who hear this all the time. Um, the last part I'll say is that my, my senior son watched The Social Dilemma on his own. Um, and he walked up the stairs and he said, dad, I watched it. It's everything you tell me all the time. <laughs> and I mean, like he, but then he immediately looks at his phone because guess what? He just got a snap from somebody and you know, I have to right. respond. So, so anyway, that top layer is that's up to the teacher. That's up to parents. Like, because you got to teach them you're in control of that. Right. So let me ask you this, you know, you wrote this book, Factor Fiction, Yep. and is that where we would go to find these lessons? Because the HyperDoc community is all about purposeful lesson design. Mm -hmm. so how can we learn more about how to really thoughtfully teach those four quadrants and, um, and with lessons? Is that in the, is that in the book? Yeah, so, so I'm gonna give you a little props. Mm -hmm. I wish we would have created a hyperdoc for this book. What we did is we put lots of elements in the book uh -huh. um, that led, we didn't just talk about it. We said, okay, here are resources you can go to and these are things you can do. And we put URLs and we put QR codes and we tried to make it, you know, as resource built as we could, not just talking about the big ideas. But because we didn't do it in a hyperdoc fashion, and again, I don't work for you three, but I, um, and, and actually I hear there's there's a troll that lives in Spain that's now part of this as well, um, sending disinformation, but, um, and that's a joke by the way. Um, what I wish we would have done is made a hyperdoc because, most of the links, most of the resources in this book that we wrote um, in 2018 still apply, but there are some that don't work um, because things change, as you know. And so I would have liked to, to have done that. Um, but currently, um, unless you have me come in and build an experience for you or do keynotes or do any of those kinds of things, this would be the resource for that information. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, Jennifer and I are, I'll call it, three quarters of the way done with book two, which That's will cool. be an extension of the work we started um, in this. Okay, That's super exciting. I mean, I, I see this as an opportunity, especially with our hyperdoc community. And I'm just gonna throw this out there really quickly. If you're interested in reading this book together, you know, in this community or collaborating on some mm -hmm. sort of project for putting uh, this work into action, please share in the chat or we will follow up and maybe just put in the chat, like let's do a fact versus fiction book club or mm -hmm. something like that. I would love to bring people together around that uh, because the beautiful thing about HyperDocs is that you can keep it up to date as things change, but a lot of things are also always the same in, and so we can bring that structure together as well as far as what works in education, putting SEL first and critical thinking with media. So um, that's really exciting to look at the potential of designing more lessons based on your book because you have. Yeah. And, and that's the part. I'm glad you brought that up. That's so I showed you the lenses and that's a big part. But the other part is showing the connection of how um, our social emotional learning is is not only we need to teach it, but how it's impacting the media and outside uh, social media, all those things are impacting how we see each other, how we make responsible decisions, all those castle competencies. Um, yeah. And then the last thing I would ask, at least mm -hmm. just as, as, as I kind of close, and I know I carried out a bunch of stuff. I don't know, um, Sarah, if you could post the, the orange um, image, the, the one that was the, the quote about subjects, um, I don't know if you can on on the fly pop that up there, um, but this is this is to me this is kind of uh, the impetus for all these things or all the things that I do, and I know I'm putting you on the spot to do this to you. Um, okay. you Got it coming, Darren. Here we go. Um, one sec. I love this quote. 
Yeah, and I, I try, I've tried several times to find the, um, uh, the origin of it, uh, and I don't know, otherwise I would give them full credit of what it is. But regardless, um, if we can't help our kids manage the emotions, if we can't help them with conflict resolution, um, if we can't handle the stress, then, then it doesn't matter that they learn all those other things because they're not gonna be able to perform well in a group, they're not gonna perform well as a society, uh, all those things. And, and I just think uh, talking about this stuff is really important. And I thank you for giving me um, a chance to, you know, our platform to be able to talk about it. We are honored to have you here, Darren. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just want to give a quick shout out to, if, if you are really inspired by what Darren is talking about, um, he has an incredible opportunity for you or your school site or your classroom, reach out to him. Um, Think Do Thrive is his consulting um, experience. Can you share a little bit about that too and what teachers could expect or administrators could look forward to if they reached out to you for that? Yeah, yeah. so first thing, if you guys do that book club, let me know and then Jennifer and I will jump in there and we'll help and be a part of it too. We'd love that. Yes. Uh, Think Do Thrive is really the third act of what I, you know, I had like a, uh, one part of teaching for 11 years. I was part of a nonprofit ed tech group for 11 years. And then this is kind of my um, realization of all those things. I've always tried to make people think. Um, I hope I did that today. I always try to get people to do things like PD. If you're not doing it, you're not going to learn it. You can't just listen to me. Got to go out and do those things. And then the last part is, 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 I hope, because of those experiences, you and your community will thrive. Um, in every professional development thing that I do, whether it's a keynote, whether it's building a program, um, whether it's uh, um, you know going to, to schools and, and doing cohorts, things like that, I try to make sure I have those three elements. Um, and I you know even tried to do that today, even with uh, weaving that in with you three wonderful people. So. Nice. Um, I'd love to help if I can. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you I have the magic elixir that's going to solve all of your school problems and fix and make everybody perfect, but I, I think I can help. Wow. I just love that every time I have the opportunity to speak with you and listen to you, you just start popping up these new thinking. I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. that, that, <laughs> more. and I could just keep doing this conversation. Um, I'm telling you guys, this is like if we had a who would you like to have a cup of coffee with, right? <laughs> the person where we might have to do like the full pot of coffee though. It would take a long time. <laughs> I know that's the problem. We should have part B, C and D of this, but um, yeah, there's so, there's so many things to, I mean, we're, we're social servants. There's so many things to do. <laughs> well, I hope you um, would, when you have new topics that you really want to talk about, come back and, and come to our community. Let's chat about this. Um, we'd love to, um, connect with you always. Um, yeah, likewise. And I'm glad that I just appreciate I've been following you three for so long. Um, and I just, um, I love to see what you guys are doing. Um, and next time you I, do need to meet the fourth um, HyperDoc guy. Um, yeah. I know that uh, David Holler would love to connect with you around this uh -huh. thing too. This uh -huh. is so he does have a name. I see. Okay. <laughs> I thought he was in a shroud, you know, hiding. No. Oh no, he's out and about. He's usually here with us on Saturdays, actually. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, Darren, we're gonna, I'm gonna let Sarah ch chime in, but we are gonna package all of your stuff in one plate and push it out there too. I just wanna oh, wow. put that out there. If you're wondering what he's all talking about, we'll push that out there too. But Sarah, help, mm -hmm. go ahead, you have a chance. I just want to appreciate, I feel like your name, Think, Do, Thrive, just says it all. You've got me thinking today. I'm ready to go do some like lesson planning and just really touch on these topics. Um, I know now who to come to when I'm doing lesson planning. I know so many secondary teachers are just tackling the topics that you've talked about today. I'm going to share with you a really cool activity that I did recently um, around fake news. And um, so thank you for being just kind of at the center of what's happening in the world. And um, you remind me so much of something I learned in my teacher ed um, credential program and uh, just the idea that our classrooms are a little slice of society, you know, um, with individual humans that bring with them different backgrounds and family experiences and life um, stories. And so I just feel like you brought me back to where I started as an educator um, 20 years ago. So thank oh, you good. so much. 
Thank you, Thank you. for you. keeping that at the center of this talk today. Yeah, ab absolutely. We, I mean, we have to. It's it's about human beings. If we don't, we have so many big things to tackle. If we don't stay together, man, we're uh, yeah. It, that, that's what scares me. That's what gets me uh, depressed in the morning. Is if we don't stay together, it's it's not going to be good. So for sure, um, we're well, the, we're at the front lines. I mean, got to do it. We do. Well, I feel like um, there's, we could keep on going, uh, but I do want to bring some closure to our conversation. And if you're watching this and you have an appreciation for Darren or you have some thoughts <laughs> or, you know, what he shared today, please share that in the chat or if you're watching it later. I think Darren knows that we have appreciations for him, but just bringing it together to that the culture code, this is our little community, and you brought some real positive energy and some new ways of thinking about uh, teaching and our, our our call of duty, if you will, as public servants. And thank you for bringing that perspective today. So if you want to learn more, we'll put those packages together, and you can reach out to Darren so you can have his email and his websites. And it was our honor to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren.